Thank you for inviting me here. I'm glad that Maria immediately disclosed that I'm a database person, so uh, everything I say must be interpreted as, uh, you know, uh, this is where I come from and this is uh, a little bit as I will explain what my motivations were for approaching the work that I will describe. So uh, what my talk will be about, it will be mostly about trying to build new methods that allow one to discover uh, an RDF graph. Discover as in what, what's there? What does this graph contain? What is the data inside? And of course, what can I do with it? So the, the motivation, the starting point was data discovery. And the tool that we study in order to help discover the data is what is called quotient summaries that I will briefly introduce. Um, summaries, graph summaries mean very different things to different people. Um, we have uh, written recently a survey on the topic at 140 references, we stopped counting. There are many different uh, definitions for that, but what I'm interested in <coughs> is summarizing mostly the data of the RDF graphs, so, so the graph of triples that connect nodes, and of course doing the right thing for the types and the schema, and as I will explain, there are some pretty complicated aspects involved there. Um, our proposal is based on using what I, we call property clicks, which is a pretty novel notion that can be inferred from an RDF graph, and that fundamentally what it does is it helps summarize graphs even if they're very heterogeneous and nodes are not identical in their structure. And as you all know, this is very common um, occurrence. We have defined these summaries. We have developed and proposed and developed summarization algorithms. And I'll briefly also discuss some perspectives if time allows. This is joint work with Francois Guazdoué, who is a professor in France, and some of our students. And we have also recently collaborated, as I will explain, with some uh, data visualization uh, colleagues from INRIA, who have written a resource uh, paper just accepted at ISWC, where they build a visualization platform for the load cloud, including also our summaries. Okay, so let me briefly go over the motivation, I don't think much is needed. Actually, when I give such talks for the database community, I always need to bring this slide, uh, you know, some of them famously said semantics is neither needed nor useful. Uh, to this crowd, I probably don't need to make the argument, but if you don't, is someone here who doesn't know the example? Do you know the example here? Okay, so let me just, I, I enjoy the example. So this is taken from the AI magazine of spring 2015. This is a data.gov open data portal of the United States. And on the left, there is a search for natural disasters and it yielded 93 data sets. And on the right is a search for earthquakes. Of this, we have 243. Maybe something is missing, right? So if we have 93 disasters but 243 earthquakes, Maybe something like, for instance, one ontology line, one ontology line, you know, could have rescued this application. So far, I don't think they rescued it, but there it is. Um, so open data is all good and fancy, and uh, you know, it's interesting to work with, but every time I show the load diagram to students, of course, as you know, they go, wow. And then the next question is, so what is everything? And I can tell them, you know, to go and click or hover over the bubble and they will see that this is open data about Institute or ECOM. Uh, they can get some information, but it's generally hard to get a quick idea of what the whole data set is about. Of course, we know that RDF graphs may or may not have types. They may or may not have an ontology. Some of the data may be typed while some is not. The values may be very heterogeneous. So it's from a database perspective where people are used to, to tables, it's a mess. Um, so what, uh, what are summaries? As I was saying, a summary, as viewed by many people, is some form of abstraction or simplification of an RDF graph that is easier to use than the original graph for the machines or for humans or for both. And very often graph summaries are also graphs themselves. But this is not even universal. So some people will tell you, well, a summary of the graph is the most frequent patterns, or is the statistics of a property co-occurrence, or very different things. And it should stay that way because different applications need different visions of what a graph summary is. And then there are further differences according to whether you worry about summarizing just the data triples of a graph, 
or maybe just the ontology. Some ontologies are large enough that you really need to do something just to summarize this ontology. Or of course, whether you're capable of summarizing both. And in the database community, and also I think in a, in a more uh, algorithmic, uh, let's say, uh, theoretical computer science uh, community, there have been proposals to summarize graphs with very clear formal properties. And some of these have been readapted for RDF with not much trouble if it wasn't for the fact that semantics typically got left behind, or to be more exact, got left outside. So you have papers and you know, esteemed colleagues, they summarize RDF, but you shouldn't have a schema and you shouldn't have ontology and you shouldn't have types because of it. So what do people summarize for? As I said, for many different purposes, but there are two main classes of applications. The first class of applications is to make query processing faster. So the idea is you get a graph, you find groups of nodes that are somehow equivalent, and you pick your groups of nodes so that you suspect that when a query will need one of them, it will need all of them. So then if you just access the group of nodes in one move, then you access them all, and especially the advantage is you don't have to search for them. You just take them in one scoop. And this is typically good for performance. A pretty different class of applications is what I would call data discovery. And data discovery is simply the process of understanding what the data is about. What do I have in this data set? What can I do with it? Is there something interesting here? And in this talk, what we do is mostly good for data discovery. At least that's our claim. We have worked with RDF data sources that you know many of you have used and know. Here we have asked a student a few years ago to you know, help us discover somehow DBLP bibliographic data. I know not very surprising, but you have to start with something. So he did a little diagram like this where he showed how many people there are, how many conference papers there are. So this is just a, you know, a pie chart by the types of subjects, nothing very fancy. And then we said, can we get more detail? Can we dig? for instance, into DBLP conference articles. So here you have a pie, kind of a pie chart that shows among 14 different properties that conference articles can have, like book title, identifier, <coughs> year, pages, and blah, blah, blah. There is one ring around this empty center for every different property, and the colors match. And the extent of the ring shows how many resources have that property, okay? So here you can see that basically the first one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, whatever properties have a very high support. And then there are some who are really exotic, barely happen over here, but you know, they're still there. So if this quiz, for instance, could be seen as one way of, of understanding or getting a look, just a sec, getting to look at the graph, but still you're not seeing much, you're seeing some statistics on properties. But however, what this thing has shown us, it has shown us, <coughs> <coughs> with further queries that the student ran, that just for this, actually it was a small fragment of DBLP, there were one, more than 130 combinations of properties that the conference papers had. So because of the fact that basically anything is optional in RDF, papers actually real life data, bibliographic papers, bibliographic data, you could think it's, it's kind of homogeneous and it's not actually. So the goal that we had was to define structural summaries of RDF graphs with several properties. The first is what I would call resist heterogeneity. So what I mean by that is that we would like summarization to understand where things are similar even though they look different in details. Uh, because we are really interested in summarizing RDF, we want an approach that behaves intelligently with respect to RDF types, I'll explain. And also, a particular point that interested us was, okay, I have this graph, it has explicit data, it also has implicit data, can I have a summary that summarizes also the implicit data? Or how in database colleagues I say, how do you summarize data that isn't there? That's an interesting challenge. And we also want to do that efficiently, of course, because we are database people, so it has to work. Um, so let me just go through the um, very basic details. I won't spend much time here. We are considering RDF graphs that are sets of triples, including classes, URIs, and blank nodes. I will make the convention that types are generally somehow blue, <coughs> written, written in blue, blue box, just to distinguish type nodes from data nodes, but otherwise 
they are all welcome. And I will work with a simple uh, ontological language, which is RDF schema, with just four uh, pretty simple deductive constraints, which you all know, which are subclass, for instance, stating that any C1 is also a C2, subproperty, stating that property P1 is a specialization of P2, domain typing, and range typing. So I will be working just with these four properties, th these four special predicates for deductive constraints, and I will show that funny things happen even just with this. Okay, as is clear to attendees of this conference, RDF is based on the open world assumption, so the deductive constraints lead to implicit triples, which are part of the graph semantically, even though they're not explicitly written there. And they are due, of course, to the explicit triples and to the application of entailment rules. And one term that I will use uh, repeatedly through the talk is what is called graph saturation. Some people call it closure, which is the result of applying all the entailment rules until no new triple can be inferred. Uh, with the rules that I have shown, uh, it's pretty well known that saturation is finite and nothing bad happens. It's polynomial time to compute and to store. Okay, so one point that was important for us when starting to summarize RDF graphs was to remember that for us the semantic of an RDF graph really is its saturation. So if I have a small RDF data graph here and I have a schema graph at its right, which should have joined on book, but I just wanted to show them separately for clarity. In fact, they are a single graph as we know. So here they do join on book. DOI1 is of type book and written by has domain book and so on. And the triples that you see in dashed edges over here are the implicit triples, which only hold in the saturation of the graph. They are due to the data triples and to the schema constraints that are stated by the blue edges. So for instance, if we know that uh, DOI1 is of type book and book is a subclass of publication, that it follows that DOI1 is also of type publication. Okay, and a few more implicit triples, but nothing more fundamentally more complicated than that. Okay, so let's consider how do we go about summarizing such graphs. Um, there are some proposals which for very good reasons want to focus only on part of the graph. So for instance, they may say, I want only the most 10 most frequent properties, or I want only the types that have at least 1,000 instances, or I want those most frequently used or having changed most frequently. Um, but what we are interested in here is to represent all the graph structure. So it is really a hypothesis, it is a starting point. Why am I doing that? Well, for a fear I may miss something. So I don't want to miss anything from an RDF graph. I want to be shown as much as possible about what the graph structure is. Um, there are some summarization techniques which have nice definitions, but they run the risk of not actually summarizing very much. So objects with pretty mathematical definitions, sometimes they, in the worst case, they may grow bigger than the original graph. And that's not very, uh, very useful summary. And um, other uh, proposals, as I said, which had already been made for non-RDF graphs, do not handle the types and the implicit triple. So, there is a rich literature, and many of them are very good for what there are, but we didn't find an appropriate proposal for the RDF graphs we had in mind. So what are we looking for? Well, we're looking for something like this. The visualization may not be the strong point here, but what you can see is that we have a graph of about 20 nodes. The violet nodes are types, and uh, the root node represents all the publications. The leaf no yellow leaf nodes are all the attributes that the publication may have. And I run through 150 million triples and I get this, and this is 20 nodes. So even if you use a smarter visualization tool that I know how to, the important part here is that we have a graph of very manageable size, which preserves all the properties that appeared in the original graph, and which shows you in a very compact, quick glance, what do we have in this graph? Just as another example, this is a graph about the French territory. It's an open data source authored by the administration. Uh, it has the sections for country, region, uh, department, uh, city, and up to the borough, I think. And this is a summary that we computed automatically from the data. And if you see this data, 
it has a spine. So the spine is this line of nodes that are all connected to each other, and every node corresponds to one uh, type, so one notion of subdivision of France geographical territory. And the edges that connect them vertically are, is a subdivision of. So this is something automatically computed with zero user input out of a data set, which is not that big, but still is large, is 370,000 triples. And you just get this in one shot, and then you can start figuring out what the data is about. So this is the kind of things that we're looking for. Okay, so the principle that we are um, using here is something pretty classical, which is called quotient graphs. Uh, if you have a graph, you consider an equivalence relation among the nodes. Somebody gives you an equivalence relation, which says when are two nodes considered to be equivalent or similar. The quotient of the graph by that equivalence relation is a smaller graph defined as follows. You will create one node for every equivalence class in the original graph. So every equivalence class will get one representative. And then for every edge that goes from N1 to N2 in the graph labeled A, you will have an edge labeled A in the quotient that goes from the representative of N1 to the representative of N2. Now, of course, what we hope from a summary is that millions of nodes will be represented together, and therefore we will achieve significant compression because the summary will have few edges, okay? Because for one million edges that go from a paper to its authors, there will be one edge in the summary, and this is a good feature of, of quotient. So they have several qualities that make them interesting for summarization. The first one that I briefly mentioned is that by definition of a quotient, all the data properties that appear in G will also appear in the quotient. They cannot escape being there because every data node is represented in the summary. And we say data edges are carried over in the summary, which means my representative will have an edge with every label outgoing my own edges. Okay. They also provide interesting size guarantees. Because it's a quotient, no way it can have more nodes than the original graph. I agree that's a weak guarantee, but still it's better than not having it. And also they have a nice property which some people would just say, okay, homomorphism. We can also call it structure representativeness. What this means is that if you are asking a query on the original graph and it has some results there, the results of the query can be embedded in the summary because every edge or conjunction of edges that you had in the graph also holds on the representatives of those nodes in the summary. Which means, if I take it the opposite way, if I have a query, just think about the graph structure, a query that says I want all the A's that have a B which has a, have a C. If I evaluate it on the summary and it's empty, then I am sure it is empty on the original graph. And this for database people is attractive because it means I can give an empty answer and not even go to consult the graph, which is cool. So this is called query pruning. Of course, unfortunately, if the query is not empty on the summary, it may still be empty on the graph because the summary loses some information. It makes an abstraction and there are some parts that are not preserved. That's what we do when we summarize. We lose some information. However, it's good enough at least to get you rid of queries that are poorly structured. Okay, so, okay, these are graph quotients, but what is the similarity equivalence relation to use? And one that has been very well known is based on what is called bisimilarity. So we say that two nodes are forward or backward bisimilar if they have exactly the same ingoing, in, sorry, incoming or outgoing paths. I'm making it brief, but that's the idea. Bisimilarity means that any graph structure that you can find adjacent to one of the nodes, you can also find it adjacent to the other. So for instance, if one of them has an incoming A, the other should also have an incoming A. This is uh, backward bisimilarity if you talk about the edges that point to the node, and of course the symmetric is forward bisimilarity, and you can also use both. So you can have the 
forward and backward bisimilarity relations, which says two nodes are equivalent if anything that happens around them is the same. Now, the problem with that is that on heterogeneous graphs, this compresses very, very little, or compresses not at all. And the reason you have guessed is because data is heterogeneous, so nodes do not agree to be bisimilar. They are very, very headstrong. So what people have done is to say, okay, let's weaken the constraint. Let's say be similar at least to some distance around the node. So it's like asking the nodes to have similar neighborhoods, even though you give up on the nodes having similar structure throughout the graph. So if you bound the similarity as much as you can, the smallest one, the weakest condition you can get, what I would call 1FB is one forward and backward dissimilarity where you're asking nodes to have exactly the same incoming and outgoing edges as logical formula. So if I have an A, you must also have an A. You can have four or five A's, I don't care, but you must have an A. And this does compress to some extent, but it's still not tremendous. So I have made uh, an example here with a small graph on the left with nodes that point to other nodes and so on. And this is a 1FB summary of the graph at left. From now on, whenever I show a summary, I will use white bubbles as, uh, to denote the nodes. It's a visual convention to say that the URI of this node is basically doesn't matter. You can think of it as a blank node. It is just a representative. So what you have here, you have one representative for all the nodes who are target of an A edge and who have no outgoing edges. So this guy represents all the A's, and this guy represents all the B's, and he represents all the D's. And here, the four nodes in the central row, they are all separated because they don't have exactly the same incoming and outgoing edges. The first one has A and B, the second one has B and D, and the third and fourth have A, B, and B, D, but they have incoming edges and they don't have the same label. So even one forward and backward bisimilarity will fail to consider that these nodes are comparable or, or similar, even these two, because they don't have the exact same edge entering and exiting. Um, so when we see that, you know, if you take one forward and backward bisimilarity and try to make it even more permissive, you get to the equivalence relation where everything is equivalent to everything. So you know, that's not meaningful. So we basically felt that forward and backward bisimilarity was doomed as a quotient, uh, as a relation for quotientization. And we started out saying we need something new. We need equivalence relations that are robust to structural heterogeneity. Basically, we would like our computer to understand that these nodes are very similar. Okay. So another question that came was, what happens with the type and schema triples? If we just do a graph quotient, can we get along with that? And you can see that there may be some problems if you look here. So this is another small graph here on the left with two nodes that are of type A and B and have some properties. And here we have a possible quotient summary in which out of uh, malice, I have decided that A and B are equivalent. Now, if the classes are equivalent, they will be represented by one node that is an unknown node because it's just a representative. And I have even allowed the two nodes to be similar because they have Ps, for instance. But the problem is that I don't really know what's happening anymore because I lost the type information. So the particularly useful information that's encapsulated in class nodes, it was destroyed by summarization in this example. So this may lead to losing class and property names. And if there were schema triples in this example, we may lose the schema triple because we may have an unknown type that is a subclass of another unknown type. It's true, but it's not very informative. And if we destroyed our schema, then we may lose implicit triples. And this is a moment where even database people wake up and say, no, 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 I shouldn't lose data. If I lose data, it's wrong. So we are not going to allow something like this. We are going to want that um, quotientization method that does not harm the schema because the schema is important for many things. So this is the one easy to fix. We fix it immediately. We fix it as follows. We define an RDF equivalence relation 
which is a class of equivalence relations, whatever you want, just give me a criterion, but, but, any class or property node should only be equivalent to itself. So this is a very simple, you know, formal hack that ensures that nobody will ever collapse my types into an unknown representative type because that's useless to me. And, uh-huh, I see now what you mean. Okay, we're going to deny it, it's okay. Uh, and then, we make one other very small decision, but important. We say an RDF summary is a quotient of a graph G by an RDF equivalence relation, of course, such that any class or property node is represented by itself. So this is very important. This will be a hypothesis for the rest of my talk. I'm not moving away from this. It is forbidden to touch the class or property nodes when you do summarization. As a consequence, for any RDF equivalence relation as above and RDF sum graph, the schema of the quotient is the schema of G. So all the schema triples are preserved. There is an obvious bad consequence, which is if you go like this, it will certainly not compress your schema. So if your schema is hundreds of thousands of triples large, this talk only has one little information for you toward the end. I will mostly focus about su on summarizing the data and the types and also summarizing the implicit triples that are not there, taking into account the ontology. I understand that schema summarization is an important problem and we surveyed a few works that, that focused on it. I, we really felt that the data side was not keeping its part of the task and especially nobody had considered what happens when you summarize a graph and if it's then it's saturated a little bit, what? So this is what the last half of my talk will be about. So just disclaimer, I'm not compressing the ontology. It's an interesting topic, I'll be happy to talk to you about it at the end. Um, so what can we do now? So let's look what this gives. We have a little graph from before. We have added one type triple here and a little ontology on the top in blue. And now I am taking the one forward and backward dissimilarity. I'm transforming it into an RDF equivalence relation, a proper one, that will always be denoted by an equiv sign. And then I'm summarizing this through that. And I'm getting this summary, which, as we said before, it compresses reasonably well the leaf nodes. It does not compress the intermediary level at all, but at least it has a schema. So what does this summary tell me? Well, it tells me that there are 10 kinds of nodes in the input, and each kind of node is defined by its outgoing and incoming properties. So this is the representative of everybody who has an A and B and D and nothing else. And you still have the information that nodes which had an A and a B and no other incoming and outgoing properties, some of them are of type C1, and C1 is a subclass of C, and so on and so forth. Okay, so what we have seen so far, we have seen RDF node equivalence and quotients, which have some good property, but we still haven't solved our requirement one, which was to have compact summaries, but of course we would also like the compact summaries to preserve the essential structure of the graph. And the other part that I teased you several times with is the summarization of implicit triples. And now we go to do this. So the main uh, technical trick that we propose for summarizing um, data graphs is what I call po property clicks. So in the example that you have already seen, we can look at N1 and N2 and decide that they are of the same kind because they don't have exactly the same properties, but the property sets overlap, intersect. So we can think that, okay, they have some variability. He was moody today and he didn't want to have a D, but they still have comparable properties. And it is pretty clear that most people will agree that the targets of A, respectively B and D edges, are similar among themselves because they are just A's or they are just B's. Um, it is okay to disagree on whether these two nodes should be equivalent to these ones. In principle, N3 and N4 also have A and B and D, but they are target of something else. So you may or may not want to take into account this while separating them. 
For instance, you can think that these are all restaurants with some information about what a restaurant can offer. And one of them has reviews, and another has, let's say, a chronic in the newspaper. So maybe you want just a restaurant with a chronic in the newspaper. Maybe this makes him stand apart for you. You would not consider that it's a thing. I think both options can make sense. So formally, what we define is property clicks, which are groups of properties that appear in the original graph, such that two properties in the same click directly or transitively co-occur. So for instance, we have A and B that co-occur on A N1, and B and D that co-occur on N2. So we put A, B, D in the same click. And of course, because we are looking at the outcoming edges, we are putting A and B and D in the same output property click or source property click. And separately, if you consider which are the edges that come to the same nodes, in this example, they are all alone. So nodes who are targets of A are not targets of anything else, and the same for all the other labels. Of course, in general, you can have also incoming input property clicks that have more uh, properties than one. You also see that I used the empty clicks in both cases, because some nodes have no outgoing, respectively no incoming edges. And you can also see by definition that the set of non-empty output clicks is a partition over the properties of the graph, and similarly for the set of incoming property clicks. It's not the same partition, okay? For instance, A, B, D co-occur on the outgoing edges, but they don't on the incoming ones. So based on this notion of clicks, I'm going to define novel equivalence relations. And I am starting with one that I call weak equivalence, which says two nodes are weakly equivalent if they have the same input click or the same output click, or they are weakly equivalent to a third one. So you see from the beginning, I'm making this relation all rich. If they behave the same in the input or they behave the same in the output, at one local level, one edge distance, or they are both equivalent to someone else. So the permissiveness is basically built in here. The only thing I'm doing is I'm saying or. And also the notion of click already has permissiveness built in, because you say two properties are in the same click even if they transitively co-occur. So it may be the case that two nodes will be considered weakly equi equivalent even though they have no property in common, right? But this may actually happen, and you may want these things to be collapsed together if and only if, of course. These nodes are very similar, for instance, from the viewpoint of incoming edges. Or if they share property with someone else, and that's the same someone else, okay? Because if you think of nodes who can have n distinct properties, there are two to the power of n combinations. But fundamentally, what this similarity does is it collapses them all into a single one. So this is the weak summary that I'm getting from my graph on the left. It has one central node that puts together these four because they have the same outgoing click ABD. The three nodes on the bottom are distinct because they have different graph structure. And the two nodes on the top are also separately represented because they don't have the same edges. And I'm putting all the edges on the same. The edges just follow. So with any quotient graph, once you have decided of your nodes, the edges just follow from the definition. Is it okay so far? Okay, so um, there is an interesting property of this summary, which is that every data property appears exactly once, exactly once. So this is what we, how we initially thought of about these summaries, and we had made actually a, in, let's say an algorithmic definition of the summary, but I'm much happier with the quotient formalization. <laughs> But the good part of a weak summary is that the size of the summary in terms of edges is guaranteed to be exactly the number of data properties from the graph, and that's usually way smaller than the original graph, plus, of course, the size of the schema. If you have an ontology, as I said, I just copy the ontology. Huh? I bravely copy the ontology and not worry about it. And this actually allowed us to do some interesting discoveries in the data, including bugs in a DBpedia. You probably found some yourself. 
we summarized uh, the BPDA person data and uh, we get this kind of things. This is a node that represents all the people. These are nodes that represent the names and then death date and birth date. And, and then we found something weird. We say, why, how can birthplace be a loop edge? So this means that some nodes are born in themselves or what? It doesn't make sense. And then uh, we asked the student and told her, you know, what's going on here? And she came back telling us that in DBpedia, you have uh, one person declared, which is Kunitomo Ikansai, that I don't know, who's of type person and whose birthplace is Kunitomo Ikansai. So, you know, this is what happens in the data. And this is something that you can catch if you look at a summary that is supposed to detect how properties and edges co-occur on nodes. So what happened here is that this node, Kunitomo Ikansai, was seen as being the source and the target of the property birthplace. And this, we got our loop. <coughs> okay, now the second uh, more restrictive equivalence relation that we introduce, we call it strong equivalence. And it's more restrictive. It says two nodes are strongly equivalent if they have the same input click and the same output click. So now we are no longer satisfied with having similar input or output behavior. We are asking similar input and output behavior with behavior defined through clicks, which allows this kind of transitive similarity that is pretty generous and helps us summarize a lot. So with this summary, with this graph here, we get a summary that is more, uh, more complex with less compression, if you will. These two nodes are considered equivalent and they are summarized together here, but these guys remain alone because they have incoming edges and the edges are not labeled the same way. So strong equivalence will not collapse a node which has an F edge with nodes that have no F edge at all. It also doesn't collapse these two because it didn't find any commonality between F and G. It didn't find any way that these two co-occur somewhere else or any reason to believe that F and G are somehow similar. If we have no evidence for similarity, we keep them apart. Okay, so, so far we have uh, two relations which allow us to summarize the uh, data triples. So in these two examples, I have taken away the schema and the type triples, so now I need to put them back. Um, what should we do about the types? So some nodes have types, and they may have multiple types, and they may have types that have no common uh, generalizer rather than RDF class or resource or whatever. And nodes having the same types is fundamentally orthogonal of them having the same properties. So there didn't seem to be a good solution here, and we simply explored all the choices. There are basically two choices. The first choice is to say I'm giving priority to data. I will summarize graphs um, by looking at their similarity in terms of data, and then I will just carry the types. What does it mean to carry the types? I will build data representatives, and I will attach to the representative of a node all the types that <coughs> the original node had. So what does it give? It, it gives something like this. I took my we c I put the schema and the type triples back, and I simply, as I said, copied the schema and carried the type. So I'm carrying this type triple from the first node to the representative of that node in the summary. Of course, you can go in the other direction, and you can say, look, types are really important. If I have types in my RDF graphs, I want to use them uh, importantly because they represent useful information. So I am first going to group the nodes by their type. Of course, there's a catch here. An RDF node can have many types or zero types. So we need to group them by what we call class sets. So what is a class set? It's simply all the types that a node has in a graph. So I'm taking that as a kind of signature and say if two nodes have the same set of types, then they are the same. And this is the first summarization step that I do. And only nodes that are poor enough to lack any type, only those will be summarized by their data. I don't find a way, there is no way to ensure that data and type similarity will be correlated. So I have to take the two options <coughs> depending on what is most important, to learn about the types or to learn about the data structure. But in any case, you will learn about both. 
It's just the priorities that may be different. So what happens here is that the node that had a type is separated from everybody else because he's the only one connected to the type hierarchy, okay? This is N1. And the other guys which are untyped are summarized as before. Okay, so we can do that with weak summary, with strong summary. So far, what have we seen? We have seen four summarizations, weak, strong, type weak, and type strong. Two of them, the last two, are first taking types into consideration, while the others are first based on data. And if you want to increase the zoo, you can also add the bisimilarity um, quotients that we have seen before. You can very easily define typed <coughs> variants of those summaries. The details are relatively easy. It's nice that you get a whole family of summaries. Uh, actually, you get a lot of connections between them, so you can compute one from another, which is kind of nice. But uh, an important point from a practical perspective is to consider the size that you achieve with summarization. And here we tested on a much more graphs than this, but these are the experiments I have on the slide. And you can see that in some cases, it's in, you know, you cannot really talk about summarization. Nothing happens here, really nothing happens. Whereas for what we are doing, we are getting modest uh, summary sizes. And for instance, uh, do I have the typed weak? No, I don't. In any case, the DBLP summary I showed was the weak one where all publications were collapsed in a single node and it carried all the different types, which may be seen as a bit too much collapsing. If you do the typed weak summary, you will get one node per property type and then it, they will kind of separate nicely. Um, so now the main, uh, the most involved technical part of what we did is to consider how to get the summary of the saturated graph, if possible, without saturating it. Why not saturate it? Because we're lazy. So we would like to find a way to get to the summary of the saturated graph without really doing the work. And we have a pretty nice theorem uh, which shows that for a bunch of summaries listed here, one way to get the quotient summary of the saturated graph is to do the following. Instead of starting by saturating, start by summarizing. So this is taking us from hundreds of millions to uh, tens. Huh? Nice. Then we saturate this, right? Because it still has the schema, so we can saturate it. It's still there. And then we summarize again. And it turns out that for these equivalence relations, it can be proved it's relatively involved, that th we say the shortcut holds, or the, the equivalence relation admits the shortcut. It allows you, it is a property of the equivalence relation, and it allows you to um, get there faster. And indeed, this leads to uh, performance optimizations. It basically divided the time by 20, so if between the standard method that saturates and summarizes, and the shortcut which goes through these alternative steps, basically the shortcut is, shaves like 97% of the execution time. It's actually embarrassing, it goes very fast. Um, I will show you one nice example which will, the one where it doesn't work because this is I think the funniest, uh, funniest uh, point. So look here, we have our little graph and we are doing its typed uh, weak summary. The type weak summary will say, okay, is there anybody who's types, who's typed? No, nobody's typed. So then these two guys, they have A and B and B, so they are similar. I put them together. They are summarized here. So what does this gentleman have? He has A and B. Done. And of course, I'll copy the schema. This says, by the way, that property A has domain D. And this is where our trouble will come from. Um, Let's look what happens if I start by saturating. I am saturating the graph, and when I saturate the graph, I know that R1 is of type C because it has property A, and A has domain C. So these two guys will be summarized separately because one of them is typed and one of them is not. And upstairs, I have started by unifying the nodes because I have thought in a hasty, or you may see short-sighted uh, way, I have thought that they were equivalent. 
And the problem is, once you summarize, nobody will ever split them again because summarization only fuses nodes and saturation only adds edges. So there is nobody to save you from a bad decision. The bad or short-sighted decision here was to summarize together nodes that you thought were untyped, but one of them, in fact, was typed. Okay, so with this, I'm getting to the uh, end of my talk. We have, um, we have devised <coughs> algorithms to build these summaries. We have algorithms for them all, and we have algorithms that go over the whole graph, figure out who's equivalent to whom, and then summarize the graph in a second pass. But we also have incremental algorithms that go over the graph and at any point they have only seen some of the da data triples, so they only have a partial knowledge of the equivalence and they summarize at any point according to what they know and not more. Uh, the difficulty of incremental summarization is that as you find another triple, you may have to revert the decisions that you took because things that you thought are equivalent may no longer be equivalent. And more frequently, things that appear different are in fact equivalent. So I'll just show you a cartoon. So this is a graph that I'm traversing triple by triple and every color of a node is an equivalence class. We start with one triple and here, so far, you know, one of them is source of property one, the other one is target of property one, two different colors. We go, somebody else, and now what happens is here we have property one and property two, and then node three it actually has a triple that goes back to node one, making node one a target of property two. And target of property two was this one. But because of the last triple that we just saw, we understood that in fact node one and node three are equivalent because they are both targets of property two. And until we visited this last triple, we couldn't have known, okay? So the equivalence relation is getting larger and larger as we traverse the data set and we basically learn which properties do and do not co-occur. When you start the traversal, you haven't even seen the data. So you believe everybody's different until proven otherwise. So at this point, you have three equivalence classes which become just one because all these guys are equivalent. And then you can continue. We are adding something else. We are adding more stuff. We are adding more stuff. So far, these guys appear isolated. Um, then we have another edge that suddenly closes the loop. And this is basically showing that, in fact, there is more commonality than we thought. And we get more people that come over there. And we get more. And in the end, uh, it boils down to this being the summary. So we have a summary that has exactly four nodes corresponding to four equivalence classes. And here you have the original graph, which had this shape, where every node is colored by the color of its representative, okay? So the interesting point here is that we had to fuse equivalence classes. This is for weak summarization. And actually for strong summarization, it's even worse because you may even have to separate equivalence classes. So the equivalence relation doesn't even grow monotonously, it grows and decreases. Okay, um, this is a short uh, graph about the algorithms. They are all linear, they go pretty far. Um, this is a screenshot of the uh, application that uh, we made in collaboration with the uh, ILDA visualization team. And actually they totally took the lead on it. We were just providers of software they took uh, our summaries and they included them in a portal that they call Lodatlas, whose goal is to provide multiple methods for uh, searching, discovering, interacting uh, with uh, Lod uh, data cloud. So this brings me to the conclusion. What we focused on was the fact that RDF graphs can be pretty large and complex and we don't have a schema and we'll never have one and that's fine. And especially they have implicit data inside. Now, structural quotient summaries, they can represent the graph in a pretty convenient fashion. Um, the software is available online. We are in the process of outputting a new version, so if you need it, maybe just drop me a line and you know, tell me how urgent it is. Uh, um, one thing that we have done very recently with a student is to say, okay, what happens if I have large uh, schema hierarchies? 
but for instance, I have a huge uh, taxonomies. So if I have nodes that have different types, but they have a common um, supertype that is not trivial, then it may be interesting to represent them in a type first fashion with this level of abstraction that basically rolls up the hierarchy under certain hypotheses that we laid out in the paper. Now, what we are working on in this area now and next, um, we have written uh, parallel uh, summarization algorithms on Spark, and uh, they've been fully implemented but not tested yet. Huh? Uh, we are also working on um, evaluating keyword search queries on RDF graphs based on these quotient summaries, which we use to basically tell us which paths could connect the nodes containing the keywords that we're looking for. So in a keyword search problem, you search for matches for n keywords and you need to connect them somehow. Um, next thing I'd like to do, I am sure that there are easy way to include some of the data values in the summary. What I have shown you so far completely erases all the URIs and all the literals that appear on nodes. I think they can be put back in a somehow controlled fashion. Maybe look at more expensive ontologies. I'm also looking forward to uh, the arrival of Miriana Mazuran, who comes from, uh, from Milano, and she uh, has a Marie Curie Fellowship for a two years project to develop kind of a summary-based data discovery portal for many types of data, including RDF. And uh, we will be looking in exploring interesting aggregates over RDF graphs based on these summaries. And this is a collaboration with my colleague Jan Lee. OK, uh, thank you. Very interesting talk. We just have three, four minutes for questions. So we are running out of time. Hi, thanks for the very interesting talk. So to me, it's very clear that this framework uh, provides completeness and compactness uh, of, the, of the summary, it's very clear. What I um, didn't understand well is uh, how, um, so, uh, so my question is about the informativeness for the users, right? Because at the end of the day, the uh, question uh, what the node uh, represents here, um, I find it a bit difficult to answer like that. So I just wonder if you did some experiment with the users and see if... Uh, Actually, no. Okay. No, sorry, so I, I, what, I, what I can say is that, you know, what my collaboration with these visualization people taught me is that, you know, uh, graph viz is not the state of the art in, uh, in data visualization. So this is how I look at them, but then they do fancy things like this. And I try to ask them, why, you know, why do you want our summaries? Why, what are they useful to you for? And he told me that what they would like in a summary is to inform about the property on type information. So the, he told me that's important. People want to know objects of type A have what properties. And this is something that they can tell with these summaries without having 130 combinations for something as simple as a conference paper. Um, and he also told me that the, uh, he w something that comes as a byproduct of our algorithms is the support. So I can tell with no effort how many nodes are represented by each graph node and how many edges are represented by each graph edge, summary edge, which can be used in a visualization, for instance, to give more proeminence to most represented nodes. And Emmanuel Pietrigao also told me that is important for them. Uh, hello. Uh, in uh, your outline, you were saying you want to apply this to a uh, keyword search, but I miss a bit the relation because uh, so if you have keywords, you are generally searching in the instance level, and uh, in fact, you are not keeping tra track of the instances. So we, I am. I am saving what I call the representation function. So I am saving. I mean, you can do it or not. If if what you, if your final goal is visualization then you will just end up with a little graph, and that will be it. And this is extremely small. Now, if you want to do keyword search on this, I'm also keeping on the side the association between every node and its summary representative. OK? So with this, it works. But you have to know 
So how the keyword arrives? Ah, then you go in the original graph and you switch to the summary. Actually, what I'm uh, doing is I'm going to the original graph to find the nodes. Then I'm going here to find the representatives. Then I'm searching for connections here because it's much smaller. And only when I have a hypothesis here, I will send it back to see if it actually is met in the data. Maybe, maybe we'll take it to the, to the break. Yes. I'd be happy to talk about it. Uh, Joanna will be here during these days, so you can meet her and discuss this very interesting talk. Thank Many you. thanks, Joanna. Thank you.